Good morning. All right. I was promised there would be marshmallows, but okay. So it seems really poignant, right, that on the last day of slush, this is when we talk about the future of mobility. Um, makes total sense, maybe in a few hours, maybe in a day or two. Most of us in this room will be in a carpooling vehicle, in a bus, in a van, uh, in a plane, on a ferry, on a train, on a tram, and hey, maybe even a combination of all of those things. Um, so mobility matters, and not just for people who want to get to really cool tech conferences, um, and not just for people who grew up still waiting for the flying cars from Back to the Future. The future of mobility matters most because it's not just about mobility. It's about the impact that it'll have, and on cities most of all. So, you know, if you think about the constant noise, you think about the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, you think about the air pollution, and the truth is that there still aren't very many places in the world where urban mobility solutions matches the public aspirations for how to efficiently get people or things from A to B. Uh, ways that are safe, that are clean, that are reliable, and that are affordable. So today, what we're going to be asking is, what does mobility hold for us 10 years down the road? Um, what are the driving forces taking us there? Should we really reinvent the wheel? And also, will I run out of transport puns before the end of this panel? Anyway, so to get to the bottom of this, we have um, you know, the future of mobility uh, will be discussed by the people who will actually be creating it, uh, which is very exciting. From a government perspective, we have Karima Deli right in front of me. Karima Deli is a member of European Parliament chairwoman of the European Parliament's Transport and Tourism Committee. Fun fact about Karima, she handled the report on sustainable urban mobility right when the Volkswagen scandal broke out, which is one of the many things that drove her to specialize in the future of air pollution and the future of mobility. Then we have Marcus Classon, who currently serves as the chief information officer of Daimler trucks, buses, and vans. Prior to assuming this position, he was group CIO of Electrolux and CEO of Electrolux IT Solutions, having the full responsibility for development, delivery, and governance on a global scale. I'm particularly excited to have uh, Marcus here with us, not just because he brings in the corporate perspective, but because, you know, seriously, guys, uh, most of the modern motor car as we know it today was developed by, by Benz and Daimler. So there's, there's going to be a bit of a history lesson there. And last but not the least, our guest is uh, Nicolas Brousson. Nicolas became CEO of BlaBlaCar just a little over a year ago, actually, in 2016. But he has been leading the company's global operations and international growth since at least 2011 as the COO. He drives BlaBlaCar's corporate development and has successfully led the company's various rounds of financing and acquisitions. Um, in, in the event there are actually still people in the room who don't know um, BlaBlaCar, they're one of the world's largest carpooling services. Now, you're supposed to embody the, uh, the startup perspective, actually, although I'm not sure if you're still technically, is BlaBlaCar still technically a startup? <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, the, the latest round of funding values the company at $1.4 billion. So, to get warmed up, <laughs> warmed up, I'm going to start with a very easy question. Um, what city are each of you from? You can just maybe left to right, right to left. Marcus? So I'm now based in Stuttgart, in Germany. Stuttgart. City, what city are you from? Or do France. you live in? Okay. I'm French, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, no, I it's think perfect. it's a country. So. <laughs> Paris. Yeah, okay. So hold that thought. What I want you to do is I want you to picture yourselves in your current cities nine to ten years from now. You know, it's, it's, it's 8.30 a.m., roughly the equivalent of uh, rush hour today in 2017, and you need to get to your first meeting. How do you, how do you get there? Maybe you can start with Nicola. Mm, I, I think what I'd love to do, you know, if I need to get to my first meeting, would be probably to cycle. Okay. Right, so if we can do that in a city, that'd be pretty cool. So cycling. I'm not sure we're... I'm going to talk about bikes later on, but that's what I'd love to do. So. <laughs> well, at least it's been said because the future of mobility can and should involve bikes. Karima. 
Good morning, everyone. I hope you are. <laughs> I know the night was very short, but you, uh, for your question, all people imagine tomorrow uh, they can use a flying car, uh, a very important uh, tr transport, e loop with Elon Musk. I believe tomorrow you have the choice. No losing your time because we have a lot of emergency. So tomorrow, the mobility will be low carbon, inclusive. Um, it means accessible to everyone and safety. Because at this moment, we have an uh, event, a uh, road accident. It uh, is too much. Okay. So, and if you could pick just one, like on that day in particular, to get to your meeting, would it be the bike? The bike. The bike. Our winners. Yeah. All right, Marcus. It's okay. No peer pressure. You don't have to say bike. How do you get to your meeting from Stuttgart? So I think uh, we are going to still need uh, some cars around. Yeah. And uh, we we'll <laughs> talk a lot about case at Daimler. Okay. Connected, autonomous. Uh, sharing and electric, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, I'll get into one of those vehicles, which uh, once I've arrived at my destination, can be shared and used by somebody else. Okay, I mean, I think there's some general consensus here about the fact that you know we're, we're going towards greener and uh, and, and shareable um, solutions. The question is maybe um, what or how. I think I'm going to ask Nicolo in the first questions on that. So, you know, Blah Blah Car has grown um, enormously, <clears throat> and we're seeing a lot of different trends, like uh, Karima mentioned, flying cars, Hyperloop, uh, you know, their gyroscopic copters, their Lexus's hoverboards, uh, Martin's jetpacks. Um, for you in the future, could you maybe name one trend that we're seeing or we're talking about in the media today that is total BS, and another one that you would personally you know, what you would personally yeah, invest yeah, yeah. in. So, I mean, m m before we go there, right, if you take a step back sure. on how people have been traveling over the last 10, 20, almost 50 years, what we tend to forget is most people travel by car, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you, when you think of countries like France and, uh, and Germany, you tend to think like, you know, people are going to take the train or yeah. they take the bus. In fact, like 80% of mobility on distances between 50 and 600 kilometers, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we serve on Blabla Car, right. is done by car. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you take a time machine, and not in the future, but in the past, five, 10 years ago, the only way you would travel from, like, let's say, you know, Hamburg to Berlin or Paris to Lyon, you take a train, mm -hmm. because Deutsche Bahn or SNCF would dominate the entire you know, passenger transport on, yeah. on rail, or you take your own car alone. Yeah. Um, Today, you have lots of choices, right? So you can take a train, you have several train companies, you have several bus companies, mm -hmm. you have blah, blah, car, you have oversharing services. So, so clearly, it's becoming more and more complex for passengers. But I think the car was central to the last 50 years and will be central to the, la to the next um, 50 years. So for sure, I Marcus agree, is the, the, the car is going to be central <laughs> to, to all of that. Um, and we're probably going to a future where um, so I guess a trend I would bank on, but it's not a big surprise, everybody mm -hmm. would bank on that. It's just like when to bank on it, autonomous car. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you know, cars are going to become increasingly electric, increasingly autonomous. And I believe in a future where it's going to be about shared autonomous vehicle. Because right. if you think of the blah, blah car paradigm, essentially we manage to educate people to share their car. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 50 million members on a global scale, still growing very fast. Um, but you know, once the car is autonomous and it's like tracked and it's very, very easy and accidents are a thing of the past, it becomes even more shareable. Mm -hmm. So I would say like in 10, 20, 30 years, uh, all the cars are going to be shared mm -hmm. and, and the big game is going to be how do you pull people into a car. Thing together. Right. Um, maybe a trend that, I, I mean, there are lots of trends that are just like a bit Longest. crazy. Um, actually, a, a quick example on that, you know, if you look at the past, it's always interesting to see like how bad we've been at predicting. Okay. So, so to me, like, you know, in the 60s, two things happened, right? We had a, a man on the moon in 69, uh -huh. and we had Moore, the co-founder of Intel, saying Moore's law says that you know, computing power is going to double every year or every couple of years. Mm -hmm. If you look like 30 years later, think of, you know, we talked about like space like in the 60s and 70s, and you look at science fiction, we should be in space already. We're not. But computing power has you know, changed okay. the world. So maybe so we should kind of keep our, keep our, um, our predictions a little bit more uh, in the safe side. We tend to get things wrong in a big way. 
Well, actually, you know, predictions are kind of part of your job now, Marcus, right? As CIO, um, <laughs> the future of, this, of, of Daimler, the future um, of this industry is something that you think about actively, but it's also a really new position. How, how long has it been? So I, I joined the, the, the company in January this year. In January. So I've, I've, I'm fairly new still to automotive and it's still a, learning, but it's a very interesting industry and fascinating in many ways. And as we heard um, yesterday in the opening speech from Al Gore, mm -hmm. we are working on some of the world's and mankind's biggest problems to solve. And that, that attracted me to the company. Yep. And uh, you know, the other thing that also attracted me is the, the cultural change in the company. Oh. We're opening up much more, we're engaging much more, we're reaching out to startups, uh, we're connecting uh, to the startup scene, to the VCs and so on. Uh, because we understand, uh, and I think any large corporation that has been around for, like us, 130 years, has to reinvent itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we are. We are about to reinvent ourselves uh, deeply and fundamentally. Uh, and that, that makes it super exciting. And of course, we, we need people like this in this room to, <laughs> to join us in that effort, right? Okay, so I heard you said the S word, startup, which, which is maybe going to, um, you know, going to give the floor to Karima on this one, because I think you know, what I really admire about your work is that startups play an enormous uh, role in how you see, um, you know, the future of, of uh, the mobility ecosystem. And you're about to launch the European Startup Mobility Prize. Could you, there are a lot of startups in this room. And I was wondering, maybe you could give them uh, a I bit of an up? elevator pitch. Can I stay up? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I decided to create the European Startup Prize for Mobility because we have a lot of emergency climate change, accessibility, safety, and air pollution. Air pollution is responsible on 500 premature days per year in Europe. We do something about this. And I am sure here you are working on transportation or mobility. So we can now find the solution and it's why European Startup Prize is your chance. You can make, you make a speech in you know, the European Parliament and you win one year, one year with a, build, with a business and, a co and a illegal coaching, including European tour in the five European major capitals. So this price is for you. Why? Because Europe is your new playground, so it's very easy. Go to the website startup.eu and to click the button and to apply. Just a one minute and it's now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you go, guys. Okay. Kimi has been to a lot of demo days. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is, a really, this is actually a really um, important piece of the puzzle. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're talking about a competition really more as a catalyst, but when you and I were talking on the phone, we're like, actually, there are two important things that need to be addressed if we really want to bring in a lot of younger, newer mobility players to the space. The first is, neither of them are sexy. The first is procurement, because uh, it'd be great if startups could win a little bit more than just a competition yeah. and could actually yeah. come into the bids. And the second one that we talked about is, uh, is the data infrastructure. Um, that will be surrounding all of this shared mobility. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about the vision of the European Union around that? Okay. Uh, all we know is very hard for startups to access to the public tenders. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these governments, um, um, the government driving calls for projects, and we have a lot of money behind, and it's not fair. Is not fair. Why I say that? Because all men, politicians, uh, snub you, startups. Because they, they see you as a young geek uh, with uh, no uh, actual economic vision. That's the reason why I create this startup prize. It's the time to show uh, we can uh, push the successful and the useful uh, for the startups is the future, I believe, in mobility and for data, because we talk about data. Uh, we have a little battle with uh, 
traditional uh, mobility player about data. The question is, who wants it? Mm -hmm. And data for me, um, for mobility, is like um, uh, water for human beings. Water um, in a several country was privatized and it's hard for poor people, right. very poor people to, um, to, to have Texas. access. So, so for me, Europe, mm -hmm. in Europe, we decide the opposite. Yeah. Water is uh, a good public. That's the reason mm -hmm. why now data, we need horizon, uh, data horizontal. Right. Data is not a, a vertical line business and we need to open data. Absolutely. We need a flag ground is now to help yeah. Um, startup for mobility. But when we're talking about, you know, you're talking about like autonomous self-driving cars, we're going to need a hell lot of more than just a bunch of CSVs uh, stuck to, a, 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 you know, an, an open government platform. Actually, Daimler's been doing some really um, interesting work um, on this front. I've been following a little bit of Movil and how, you know, you're leveraging a lot of uh, SDKs and moving a lot more towards a, a platform mindset. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about this and how it fits into uh, in the future of what you're trying to do? Uh, well, yes, I mean, it's, it's part of that reinventing of, of, uh, of, of our company and our business, extending uh, our business models beyond the product itself into the ecosystem mm -hmm. um, and, and looking for those opportunities. I, I myself represent, as you said, truck, uh, bus and van. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at logistics, for example, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, it's um, uh, for now, uh, you know, our focus is um, around making our customers successful uh, in the sense that, you know, the product doesn't break down, uh, there is a low TCO, total cost of ownership to operate the vehicle, etc. But in the future, it's, it's much more around how do we actually optimize the entire end to end. Mm -hmm. and, and I think whether you talk about logistics end-to-end -end or yeah. whether you talk about your personal journey end-to-end, yep. -end, uh, you know, you have a lot of parallels there. And, and that's what's, you know, becoming interesting for us to explore uh, in, in this kind of environment mm -hmm. uh, to open up and, and to, you know, take those impulses and, and transform those into new models um, that works for us as well. No, I mean, that's great. And, and um, actually, I'm going to give the floor to Nicola now. Uh, not just because a newspaper uh, leaked that you had been forming a data alliance with a lot of uh, public transporters, but also that um, you know you're going into short distance mobility as well with with blah blah lines, yep. um, which you know requires a, an enormous amount of data compared to uh, your long distance solution. Maybe you could tell the public a little bit more about blah blah lines and how it fits in your vision. Yeah, no. So essentially, we as you know, we started blah blah car, yeah. and essentially we educated people on shared mobility but pretty much on long distance, mm -hmm. right? So it was people doing Paris to Lyon or Munich to Hamburg and this type of, of journeys. We never really solved with Blah Blah Car the commuting angle. Okay. So it's like you know, people going daily to work. So in France, I think it's about like 14 million people mm -hmm. every day take their car, go to work. Um, car occupancy actually in commuting is 1.1. Right. In France, it's the same in every country in Europe, so it's absurd. Mm -hmm. So it means essentially you carry three empty seats every day uh, to work. So we decided to tackle that. We launched a new product called Blabla Bla Lines, mm -hmm. which is the same concept philosophically as Blabla Bla Car. So it's about shared mobility, but applied to your daily commute. Um, what's interesting there is, you know, Blabla Bla Car was more of a, you, you can develop that as a standalone community. Blabla mm -hmm. Bla Line gets much closer to existing public transport. Yeah. So we try to integrate that into public transport. We need to share some data um, with existing public transport. So today on Blabla Lines, we can show you like, you know, essentially you have a metro getting you to a stop and then maybe a car is going to take you for the last uh, couple of miles, for example. Um, so if we crack that, that's pretty, that's pretty fundamental mm -hmm. because you, if you're just able to increase car occupancy on commuting, you're going to reduce traffic enormously. Um, you're going to connect all kinds of points on a map that are not connected. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you look at data today, I mean, to me, you have different type of data. You have all the existing transport data, which is like the timetable of the trams and the metro and so on. Uh, and you have consumer data, like where people are exactly going to and when. Um, so we're gathering that essentially, right? We're pretty good at understanding where passengers really want to go. And today, like public transport, they're pretty good at knowing what they've built and, and the timetable of the metro and the tram, but they don't really know where people end up going okay. at the end of the day. 
So if we can work together and map that together, that's pretty powerful. And today we get, um, especially on blah blah lines, uh, we get actually pulled by cities. So we get some help by you know, the city of Paris, and we yeah. get like even a subsidy of two euro per ride from the city of Paris. So, so that's when the old like private public sector kind of emerge together, right? Because we, we end yeah. up getting some subsidies to launch so, lines. So I'm curious about that because at the same time, what you're doing is you're lowering the cost of transport and you are algorithmically replacing bus stops. Are, to what extent are you also disrupting public transport then as opposed to joining it? I think you do a bit of both, right? So, so okay. you, you, you know, does it complement the existing network? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it going to partially replace the existing network? Possibly, mm -hmm. but I think it's a mix of the two, and, and, you, know, and you don't know to what extent. And at the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it should be consumer-led, right. right? So if it's easier for a passenger to jump into a car, pay three euro, go mm -hmm. to work, come back in a car, and that car is going anyway, it's just going empty, that's probably a better thing for the driver, a better thing for the passenger, a better thing for traffic, a mm -hmm. better thing for the environment. Um, so at some point, I think it's going to work itself out, right? It, it needs to be very consumer-driven. Um, as opposed to maybe more regulatory driven or transport system driven. Okay. Um, I can see the time that's moving a little bit. And um, th we actually have a, so this thing is a, you know, questions from the audience. And there's one question that was obviously going to come up at some point, and it's, uh, it's about will somebody drive cars and will, will people still be driving cars in the future? We've addressed this to a certain extent, but I know. Marcus is a very uh, signal angle to this. If we're talking about shared transport, we're talking about um, you know services and ride like ride hailing companies and things like that. Then what what is the future of uh, of individual transportation when this happens? What what's the future of Daimler when this happens or if it happens? Well, I mean, horses used to be the tr main sort of mean of transportation yeah. at one point in time, and people still ride horses, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phew, safe. <laughs> so. But it's difficult to predict uh, mm -hmm. how these new models, um, business models, and, 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 and ways of, of transporting goods and people will evolve. And to be honest, I think that's why we're here, to co-innovate, to co-create, yeah. um, and, and to define that, that future together. Uh, it, yeah. It's true it's a lot less straight cut than I thought. Actually, on, on the tram on the way here, um, I was looking up uh, some of the numbers, and you know, contrary to what we think about the decline in, in car sales and things like that, Mercedes uh, declared 18% growth yeah. and a, a sales record. So clearly there's some things that haven't quite been mapped out yet. Um, so we have four minutes, and what I think I'm going to ask one general question to sort of close it. Um, you know, Nicolas was talking earlier about the 60s, back when everything was about the car, and now the car is, is you know, part of a, of a much larger puzzle. And back then, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, insurance, roads, bridges, um, uh, gas stations, roadside stores, roadside hotels, an entire infrastructure that was built around when cars were, cars as they, you know, were at the time, were in the center. In, in the future of, you know, an integrated mobility system, what do you think is one piece, like one key piece that we need um, for, for it to come about? But yeah, maybe to jump back, I mean, I'll partially answer, sure. but to, to jump back on the discussion on the future of cars, I, I mean, to me, one thing that's pretty obvious is, yes, cars will become autonomous. So mm -hmm. the question is not really like, are they gonna become autonomous? It's more like when and who's gonna control what, when who's gonna control right. the operating system in the car. Mm -hmm. An interesting debate though, and you were talking about like, you know, trends that might not happen, I'm very dubious about the fact that essentially people will not own cars, for example. Oh, yeah. So I wrote some, uh, some articles on that, and I think in like 10, 20, 50 years, even though you have autonomous vehicle, people will still own cars or lease cars or have access to a car all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'll go into a car ownership model where all the cars in a country are going to be owned by two or three players. Mm -hmm. A, because it makes zero economic sense for a company to have like, you know, uh, tons of cars on the balance sheet, so it makes mm -hmm. no sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, and number two, a distributed system is probably a better system. Mm -hmm. And the trend you talk about about car sales is very true. I think car sales are not going down. And, um, and if you look at like every new car that's closer to autonomy, like Tesla, you have like a one-year backlog to buy some of these cars. The first company that's going to release an autonomous car is going to have like a backlog of like a couple of years to sell that car. Right. So, so I think people will still own car. They're just going to be shared a lot more. 
So okay. we st we're going to stay in a world of distributed ownership of cars, right. and they're going to be, again, like shared a lot more through car sharing, ride sharing, um, and, and we're going to increase car occupancy and car usage this way. Okay. What about you, Kuma? Um, I believe the, the biggest um, game changer is for car. I believe um, individual car will be disappear because... Um, oh. Yeah, so because, really yeah. <laughs> really, because yeah, really. Two French people, we have to debate. Of yeah, course. but, but <laughs> I, I believe really individual car is in, is in no sense. You talk about autonomous car. I'm totally agree with you. But the problem at this moment, we have a lot of emergency when you talk about autonomous car. We have a, a, a we have a, the issue of cyber security, legal responsible, and data. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. So I believe the future for the car. <laughs> really? I'll turn yeah. to Marcus. Um, I believe really uh, we have a lot of uh, center city uh, should be more carless. So the future of the car is to share. So we want to create a new economy, collaborative economy like blah blah car. I don't say that because it's my uh, <laughs> neighbor, but it's true. <laughs> but f but we don't forget we have other. Um, we have no other, um, um, for example, with Uber, etc. At the European level, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Uber is an economic platform, and Blah Blah Car is a collaborative platform, a uh, collaborative economy, because we don't have the same system. So, for your question, very quickly, I believe tomorrow we tra public transport need to be a, a, a public uh, platform. Mm. So transport on demand uh, must, I believe, must uh, uh, better, pl uh, better, uh, better role in, uh, in the transport public. So a new link okay. between, for example, bag sharing, mm. car sharing, etc. And if uh, you look, just, just jumping for one sec on, on what you say, what we've done with Blabla Car, in a way, we took the car, the mm -hmm. private car, and we kind of make that public transport because mm -hmm. you share it. So I agree that you know, the car won't be individual in a sense that you'll share it, yeah. but I think car ownership is going to remain like, you know, owned okay. by people. So we're at the end of our time, which means that, Marcus, you will have the great honor of closing the panel <laughs> with a few words so that will echo. Just a couple of final comments. And I think the digital disruption, uh, what we've seen is that it makes people's lives, easy, lives easier in many ways. Yeah? So I'm, I'm with you. It will integrate different means of transportation. And sharing is absolutely an element of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, very exciting future in that sense. Seamless and end-to-end and, and optimized. OK. Well, um, maybe you'll join me in giving our speakers a round of applause. Thank you very much for your time.